Welcome to Weird Web Radio, an explorer's guide to hidden worlds of the paranormal and occult, reality expanding experiences, and the downright weird and bizarre. With your host, Lonnie Scott. Hey, gang, welcome to another episode of Weird Web Radio. I'm your host, Lonnie Scott. In this episode, we are talking to Christopher Arepolo and Tara Love McGuire. You know them both as Chris and Tara from Down at the Crossroads podcast and the authors of the new and amazing book, Bessem, Stang, and Sword, A Guide to Traditional Witchcraft, The Sixfold Path, and the Hidden Landscape. I cannot recommend you, you go out and get this book enough. It's going to start challenging some of those little status quos that have been maintained for more than a few decades now. And we take a pretty deep dive into witchcraft and their ideas on how it all should be practiced and some of the things that they have both changed and would like to see change. And we just really do what I do on this show. We dig into the way they think and feel about witchcraft and magic today. I would like to take a moment to dedicate this episode the same way Chris and Tara dedicated their book to the loving memory of Sarah Elizabeth Leiter, born 1985, passed in 2018. Sarah, you'll always be remembered among your friends and family, and everyone out there, go have a happy meal in memory of Sarah. Please remember that you can always be a big help to the show by subscribing and rating Weird Web Radio on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and any app out there where you listen to your favorite shows. Let the world know what you like and show this show some love. Share Weird Web Radio on your social media. Help get the word out to everyone. You can also gain access to the bonus audio sessions that I have with my guests along with all those other fun rewards by joining our unique membership. Go to patreon.com slash weirdwebradio or weirdwebradio.com to click the mem- click join the membership. It only takes $5 a month. That's it. That'll get you started. That's less than you're going to spend at Starbucks today. I know because I've been there and I did it. That money helps this show grow. It helps me create more chances to get more guests to do more things to bring you more awesome stuff and one more thing if you're looking for help or insight into your life you're ready to get those answers to the questions that keep you up at night maybe you just need some direction to get unstuck out of all that routine that you get so bored with i'm an international award tarot reader i've been awarded tarotist of the year from the tarot professionals association so go to tarotheathen.com and reserve your reading today. Or you can go to weirdwebradio.com and just click tarot in the menu. Listen up, folks. I don't want to be between you and my guests any longer. I do want to say one thing. There were some audio issues for some strange reason, and it took some work in production to make it all right. So I'm going to sound like I have like a frog in my throat or something through a lot of this. And I apologize if it becomes sort of difficult to hear or it sounds strange to you. Um, The content is still the same. And thankfully, Chris and Tara's uh, audio came out perfectly fine. So enjoy the show, my friends. Stay weird out there. Chris and Tara, welcome to Weird Web Radio. I'm so glad to have you here. And thank you for taking the time out from being down at the crossroads to join me on Weird Web Radio. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, <laughs> thank you for joining yeah. us. Yeah, there you go. I'm so used to saying that as a host. We're happy to be here. <laughs> right? <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what happens when our powers combine and two paranormal podcasts are on the same place at the same time? Mm-hmm. Everybody <laughs> How starts Tupac thanking and Snoop Dogg say it. <laughs> That's right. Ain't nothing but a gangster party. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Now that we've all had a good time and good laughs, um, let's go ahead and just start somewhere nice and simple mm-hmm. how'd you two actually get together and enter into this whole realm of the occult on a journey with each other <laughs> um wow well <laughs> well i said simple you said simple <laughs> oh Lonnie. um so we have been together for coming on to 18 years it'll be 18 years in july 
yeah. um, that we've been together. We got together in 2001 and we met because long story short, very long story short, we met because I got kicked out of the UK and had to move back home with my mother and I was working with her in an office and I met a woman there who was pagan who out on a smoke break said, oh, I go to this weekly book thing at Borders for pagans and witches and the guy who runs it, I think you guys would really get along. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's funny because I'm engaged. And she was like, oh, well, whatever, you know, you guys can still hang out. And that's where that kind of started. Um you got to explain a little bit more than that. You were, no. you just said you're engaged. I was, and now I look uh, like bro- I'm a fiend or no, something. We, we, <laughs> it didn't work out. Yeah. Um, yeah but first yeah, of all, the cliff notes, you're kicked out of all, a foreign country. Yeah. And- <laughs> <laughs> Technically, uh, I was not granted entrance into the UK. Um, I now have and remain have to this day on my passport, uh, two black marks, of being disallowed into the UK. Um, They didn't think I was going to go home. Again, long story short, they didn't think I was going to go home. And it was a whole huge complicated thing. But yeah. So, but that's ultimately how Chris and I met. (laughs) And we were both already into boo spooky stuff like witchcraft and the occult and, and things like that. So it just kind of clicked in a really interesting way um, and continued clicking for almost 18 years. Okay, yeah, so I, I guess I want to pose this question to both of you, and you can answer in whatever order you want. Mm-hmm. But I, I'm really curious, you know, we get involved into witchcraft and the occult at various levels of our life, and we dip in and out of it if you're like I did. Um, and get really curious, lots of reading, practicing. But something usually happens that indicates that this isn't just something that feels cool or sounds cool. Mm -hmm. Like this has some real grit, teeth and power behind it. So for both of you, what were that, what was sort of that convincing moment that not only am I studying something interesting, but this has real power. Hmm. You can take this one first, sweetie. I answered the last one first. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's a, it's yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, it was always, it was always something you know, was interested in and did, and just kind of felt like I got something out of. Um, but it wasn't until I had one or two experiences during a personal ritual where. I, I knew that there was definitely something more to this. And, um, and, and what it was, was I saw figures standing about me, um, and movement about me that, um, the figures themselves, the best way to describe them is like the predator is in the movies in the predator when it has its cloaking device on mm-hmm. and it's moving around in the jungle or in the city, depending on what movie you're watching. <laughs> Um, that image, that weird reflect refraction of light, but yet you see a figure, like a shape, a shape is what I saw in ritual. And that was really cool. And I was like, Whoa. And that it's in itself was actually really confirmed later when I read uh, my life with the spirits written by Lon Mila Duquette. And he described that exact same phenomena in ritual when he talks about the first time he summoned a, a goetic demon hmm. and he, that he saw a shimmer in the air. And I was just like, I know exactly what this man is talking about. <laughs> I was like, Holy shit. I know exactly what he's talking about. You know, like I'm not just fanboying here. It's like, I have been there. So that, I mean, you know, it's not a grandiose story, but it was definitely uh, an awakening um, or rather a confirmation at that point in, uh, in some of this stuff. So. Sure. And Tara, what, what was your sort of, uh, awakening or confirmation moment? Um, well, I was always, I was always a very weird kid. Um, my family grew, uh, my, my family moved around a lot. We weren't, we didn't live anywhere for very long, um, until I got into high school and that was the longest we lived anywhere, which was five years. Like we were in that house for five years. And before that it was like every one or two years we were moving to a new place. So I didn't have a whole lot of friends and I was already just kind of odd on top of that. Um, 
and we typically lived in like semi-rural to rural places like close to the pine barrens in the pine barrens near there um so i kind of had to make my own fun (coughs) excuse me and i was also very much a voracious reader so i was constantly reading things about uh the greek and roman gods and the celtic gods and the egyptian gods and going into places like that and folk tales and fairy tales and just pulling in like all of this information and just adding more and more to the weird that was already there um and i kind of just started doing weird little witchcraft things on my own like i didn't know what i was doing but i felt that i was practicing witchcraft like if someone were to ask me what were you were doing it would be i i'm making a spell you know that that type of response to it and this continued on for for a, a number of years and flash forward into my teen years um I had done some reading, not a whole lot at this point. I was probably, I think, a freshman, a freshman in high school. And no, no, I'm sorry, not a freshman. I was a junior in high school, a little bit, little bit older. Um, I was a junior in high school and my very first boyfriend, who shall remain nameless, uh, cheated on me with one of my friends and started dating her instead. So one night, in a fit of uh, woman scorned, I put together a working where I wanted him to get into a car accident. Um, And the next day at school, I found out that him and two of our friends had gotten into a car accident and flipped his car. Everybody was okay. (laughs) Um, Except maybe for me, I had quite a bit of a freak out over that. Um, But it was like, it was the confirmation that, all of this meant something. Um, it, it was, I mean, it, it could have been any number of coincidences that actually caused it to happen and who actually knows. Um, and I, I'm also just naturally a very skeptic brained kind of person, but that right there, like those two instances so close to each other, it, it's a little hard to ignore. And for some people they may have ran from that. And I kind of dove more into it because it, I was seeing that, rights could be wronged yeah it's a it's a way into all of this i think Mm -hmm. that would resonate with some people because that heightened emotional state Mm -hmm. and allowing it to just unleash on another human being Mm -hmm. uh for good or ill yeah um, is often a very powerful moment and um yeah, I could see very easily how that would lead you in. Mm-hmm. You just said something that it's very interesting to me in that you have a skeptic's mind. Yes. And yet here you are yeah. uh, pursuing <laughs> years of mm-hmm. witchcraft, right? Mm-hmm. So um, there, there's a lot of people out there who are like that, who are who are very curious and probably find themselves getting results and yet trip over their own skepticism yeah. and fail to follow it further. Yeah. So how do you manage your skepticism? Um, it's difficult because it, it impacts you so much as a practitioner um, because you, you can't fully get into a moment unless you can let go of the moment. Right. Um, and if you constantly have like this voice saying to you, this is ridiculous. This is dress up. This is play acting. You're, this is just foolish. What are you doing? It's so hard to let go of that. Um, one of the things that I find helps this is using entheogens. Because it, it kind of dulls down the, the skeptical side of things. It loosens you up. Like you're, you're not getting blitzed and going into a working you still have to have your faculties about you but if you have like that 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 uh channel lubricated a little bit enough so that you let down your guard that can be helpful um set setting just the entire environment can be helpful too like when we when the coven gets together and we do things for the full moon or the dark moon we have a whole setup that happens when we're doing full on full blown ritual and everything leading up until that moment is getting you into the mindset of what is coming. Um, and even like the beginnings of the ritual, it starts out very informal and then slowly builds into, um, 
a, tra a transition of reality is probably the best way to put it. Um, and I find those things very helpful, but at the same time, that little voice is so loud. Uh, cause I'm also, I, I have very much a critical thinker too. I don't automatically swallow what's been handed to me. I have to ask a thousand questions so that I'm able to get my hands around it. And I think Chris is also very much, uh, this type of personality quirk or not, um, all just kind of like moony eyed about things and oh this is a manifesting and higher powers and blah 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 blah. we question things we want to make sure that what we are seeing is what we think we are seeing because then we will we will absolutely be able to pour all of our own power into it in a case like that but if there's a flaw then you can pick that apart and then maybe this isn't what you thought it was um going to chris for a second how do you deal with your your skepticism since she says you've got that same sort of critical factor that you're overcoming i mean i was i was thinking about that as she was talking and i honestly don't know um and i, I think you're better at it than i am too well i think i i don't have any um i don't have a background in theater or drama but i think i can step into in a sense, I guess. And I'm really just thinking on the spur of the moment mm -hmm. here, like how to answer this and how to understand it from my own perspective. Um, but how to step into that role of the practitioner and what needs to happen emotionally, mentally, bodily, you know, um, kind of like fake it till you make it. Mm -hmm. And then when you make it, it's like, holy shit, it's there. It's happening, you know, because that's the only way you're really going to experience any of that. Um, is if you allow yourself to, at least for the moment, engage with that paradigm, um, if not prep for that paradigm, you know, a day in advance, a week in advance, a month in advance, depending on the working. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if you're a solo practitioner, it's a lot easier to allow yourself to be in in that state a lot easier because you don't have to answer to the expectations of others or the judgment of society. Um, I, I mean, for example, I'm not a big proponent of public ritual. I, I mean, I used yeah. to go and I enjoyed them and they, they served a communal purpose and I met a lot of people and, and I would go to them for those reasons to meet people. But I think on a magical level, they never did really what they were supposed to do for me. They were me. just for fellowship. It but, was, yeah. yeah, it was very tough to get in that proper headspace when you're dealing with somebody coughing next to you or, or giggling or someone's child running around screaming when you're all supposed to be quiet and meditating. Yeah. Um, it, you know, so I think being alone is definitely a, you know, dance like no one's watching kind of thing, <laughs> you know? So no, I like that. I, I, I resonate absolutely uh, with the idea of public ritual. I'm part of ADF mm -hmm. and one of my many hats that I wear and, you know, ADF has this whole thing about having public rituals, and I've helped build a pretty good grove mm -hmm. uh, in a town that's about an hour north of me. Mm -hmm. And I I like to read the omens, take take read the runes for the divination portion of rituals. But beyond that, I don't, I can't connect in a public format. I just yeah. don't dial in the way I do when I'm doing my own trance work and my own work at home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I completely understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think there's also an aspect of expectations because people get into things <clears throat> like witchcraft and they have this very Hollywood fantastical notion of what witchcraft is and, and how magic works and what magic can accomplish. And it, it's kind of like someone thinks, oh, uh, like the, the constant never ending argument about love spells and the ethics and morals of love spells and how it's just not right because you're taking someone's free will against them. And it's, that's not what magic does. You cannot turn someone into your literal zombie slave and completely subvert their will. It's, there has to be something there, some kind of thread that the magic can manipulate and, and increase the chances of and doing all of those things. Um, it, it's not fantasy. And I think when people come into it expecting fantasy uh, and they don't get fantasy, it's a lot harder for them to um, stick with it. 
And for people who are coming into it with a more critical mind who aren't expecting Flights of Fantasy, I think we're the ones who actually stay with it longer, surprisingly. Um, we're mm -hmm. the ones who get more into it, who are more serious about it, rather than the uh, sparkly unicorns and changing hair color <laughs> like in the craft or whatever it was. <laughs> or, or no, no, no. She changed her eye color first and then her hair color. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, group work in general is just difficult. You know, sure. you, you have to yeah. really all be on the same page with yeah. each other. Yeah. And you really have to, in a sense, be... A, you really have to have that group mind going. You mm -hmm. have to have a really just a good group of people. It has and to I be think, a cohesive unit. Yeah. And I think if, you know, the more people you have, the more difficult it is to get that cohesiveness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, which is why working alone is so easy because you don't have to worry about anybody else but yourself. Um, and that's not to argue against group work because mm -hmm. we do run a coven and, you know, we've, since the book has finally come out, we're able to focus more on that and to work more with others. Build that practice and build up. Build that and practice yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, talking about witches and witchcraft always wants, or always leads me to, to wonder from your own viewpoint, when you say the word witch, what does that embody to you? Um, the the flip answer is someone who practices witchcraft. Um, <laughs> right. But I'm, uh, I'm not necessarily... A, you don't get away with the flip answers here. <laughs> Damn it. Um, but it, it's... A, a, a witch is someone who is on a particular path. Um, and in, in my view, that path is one of sovereignty, um, of reclaiming one's personal power and of getting into, uh, get, getting into touch with the, the spirits that are around them and the internal work that comes along with things like that. Like it's, it, it's not just, going to your local PPD in a crushed velvet cloak and a three wolf t-shirt and circling, you know, for the closing ritual of the day where everyone stands and calls quarters and reads off of loose leaf notebook. Um, it's, it, it's a full on life. You know, there's never anything that isn't involved in witchcraft when you are actually a practicing witch. Um, even when the people, when there's people who talk about, they go through lulls where they're not really doing anything and in, in their mind, because they're not pulling out all the bells and whistles, they're not doing anything, but they're still doing other things. They're just not realizing it. They still have their contact with their spirits. They still do their small workings, uh, all of the things like that. So it's. Uh, back to the flip answer, which is someone who practices witchcraft. Um, it's someone who's <laughs> fully immersed in it. Um, in what Chris and I ha have uh, laid out as being the sixfold path, um, specifically for us, that is witchcraft. Yeah. Um, our personal way of understanding. Our personal way of understanding. Of, and explaining what witchcraft is to others. Right, right. Um, which we, I mean, we honestly think it's probably the, the best way to explain witchcraft, at least from a Western perspective in the 21st century. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people try and shy away from talking about witchcraft in any kind of definitive manner but it's like you know what if we're all quote-unquote practicing witchcraft and we call ourselves witches we have to know what that implies we have to know what it means yes and even though witchcraft as a concept can be very um open-ended in a historic context and people and, yeah and very nebulous you know people like to do, just be like well it's in this time period it meant this and in that country it meant that i'm like you know what that's great and the etymology from but old norse and to, blah, blah, blah. yeah but today we we start <laughs> to have an understanding of what that starts to mean mm -hmm. you know um it's the modern movement is you know a decade or so away from its hundred year mark you know um mm -hmm. We're understanding that which I mean, I, I I think right now we understand witchcraft is a practice that is not a religion. And as far as the six path, six fold path goes, you know, we look at it as being uh, based in history and lore, you know, for context, but also including magic, divination, herbalism, uh, necromancy and hedge witchery. And within all of that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
What wonderful answers you two give. <laughs> <laughs> Within all of that, what would you consider or even hope or desire for the role of the witch to be in Western culture today? Hmm. Um, that's, that's a very good question. Um, I think it's a very, in its essence, you know, it's, it's a solitary path, honestly, I think. It, it is. The thing that's going through my head yeah. as I'm thinking about this is it is still, it's still the life of the outcast, but in 2019, in the Western hemisphere, there's not too much with outcast. Like you, you're, you're in society and out of society at the same time. Um, so like with every other question that gets asked of us, if it, is it A or is it B? And the answer is yes, which I'm sure people are so tired of hearing. Um, mm -hmm. But it's the same, it's the same concept. You know, are you an outcast or are you in society? You're both. Um, and I think that I don't personally like the full on public view of witchcraft where there are things like uh, bake sales and drives for governmental recognition and, and things like that. Like what I do when I'm doing this is none of my business. The PTA doesn't need to know that I'm a witch. Um, it's just and, and I, I'm very privileged to be able to say things like this because we live in yeah. a very liberal part of New Jersey and it's not like we're in the Bible Belt somewhere where if you don't go to church, you're you're a pariah of the community. Um, so I, I absolutely understand my privilege, but. It, it's it's still it, it sticks with me. Um, it's both. And I feel like we need to have more of a um behind the scenes role of things like not so much out in public and yelling in news cameras about public hexings and yeah i mean that's fine for other people yeah it, um, it's just not i mean i th i think probably the role of, of the witch there's 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 not going to be one role there's going to be multiple def roles def definitely definitely there's going to be multiple roles you know people are going to find how their craft manifests in their lives and in the world around them but i think probably I think at least one way to add at least one role to add to this conversation is the role of finding out what witchcraft was. That's a fair and, question. Yeah. You know, what was it? You know, we know it wasn't some fertility religion. Okay. We know it wasn't some harvest ridge religion that, that went underground and, and resurfaced in the 19th century. We know that that's BS. And I, you can keep that in the show. <laughs> okay, that, that's an, no, it's an honest statement. We know that that is crap. It had it helped inform the modern revival, but we know that that's nonsense. And I'm a, I mean, me personally, I'm not going to speak for Tara on this, even though I'm pretty sure she's going to agree with me. Um, but I'm a part of the, the idea that you know what we need to shed some of these nonsense ideas and try to find out what it was and what it could be. And, Fair. Not fight, so, and not fight so much about what it was at the same time. Like um, one, one yeah. of the things that I do, one of the classes that I do uh, is a flying ointment class. And there's always this talk whenever you bring up flying ointments about uh, how were they used in the past and did witches use them? And if so, how? And blah, 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 blah. And endless, endless arguments and debates. And is there proof? No, there's proof. Yes, I have proof. And on and on and on and on and on and in my class i talk about very briefly very small amount of history and i make it a point to say none of that matters does it work does it work here's some recipes that we came up with and the idea of it being a flying ointment i'm going to tell you all about how to make them <laughs> and everybody gets all excited because it's like i don't have to spend 45 minutes talking about very dry history that does not matter in 2019 like know your roots mm -hmm. but face forward yeah so finding out what witchcraft was is to me the second secondary uh plot and the first plot being is what witchcraft is going to be like where is where is it going 
what shape is that taking? How can we take the roots of our history and make them grow into this beautiful thing and continue to grow and evolve and change and live so that it does not become a dying art? It becomes a flourishing art. How do you decide when you're you're going into history and looking at the roots of what it was, how do you decide what's worth keeping? Uh a lot of the time you have to look for um if it's not a primary source you've got to check and find out where somebody's sources came from you can't just swallow the information um that's how we wind up with things like uh uh esoter and the easter and rabbits and stuff like that having nothing to do with those holidays um so that that's like one thing that you have to do but you also have to um look at things on a slant because the information is not being presented straightforward a lot of the time like when you're looking in folk tales fairy tales uh regional superstitions regional stories things like that they're not going to spell it out pretty and plain um stand here and do this like the witches of yore you know you're going to have to read things with a critical mind yeah and realize that there might be a grain of truth here and there mm -hmm. um and you're never going to truly know. And that's another thing too, like. Except not knowing. <clears throat> yes. Except that you may not actually know, but mm -hmm. with a little critical thinking, little out of the box thinking, you can begin to put two and two together. Like when Isabel Gowdy talks about going to the Sabbath, people going and attending the Sabbath, coming and leaving to the Sabbath as animals, or even the sex with animals that may or may not have, had have gone on allegedly at right. these sabbat gatherings like what does that mean what does that mean were they actually fornicating with animals or were are we talking about shape-shifting mm -hmm. you know it's like people stuff wear, like that people stuff wearing like masks that. yeah 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 you know? stuff like mm -hmm. that so it's kind of like take what's being said but like wonder uh, things will just occur to you like mm -hmm. that thing that i just referenced you know yeah. it, it kind of occurred to me as i was going through it and i was like wait a minute mm -hmm. There's a way to explain this and it can still mean the yeah. same thing. Yeah. Run it through your SMRT filter <laughs> <laughs> and see what comes out the other side. Yeah. Like, do you really think that people are boning donkeys? No. Does someone uh, most likely wearing a donkey mask because they're doing this whole ecstatic uh, for, yeah, dance for or what, whatever's yeah. going on? Like, yeah, probably. And then some doofus church guy you know, muddled into the, into the show and was like, Oh my God, they're boning donkeys. And now everybody thinks that's what was going on. When in reality, it was something entirely different. <laughs> medieval fur. What are they called? Furries? Yeah. Medieval, yeah, medieval furries. furries. <laughs> medieval furries. They're just they're just this is the second time that furries have come up in an interview with us. Yes. Well, this week. <laughs> in all fairness, you brought up having yeah. sex with animals. <laughs> That is true. Chris brought it up first. Um, true. I just described so, it. So it's, it's kind of like that. It's like, you know, you, you go through it and you see what's being talked about and you, you just kind of, you see if it works, you see if it doesn't work, if it makes sense, you know, like how does it fit into the rest of the puzzle, which inspect is Inspect it witchcraft. from each angle. Yeah, Try to poke holes in what's being said. Yeah. Try to think of other reasons for why these things are being said and how they're being said in the context in which they're being said who is the one who is speaking the words like or putting them down on paper what have you um all of those things are very important but at the same time not spending all of our time and spinning our wheels in endless arguments about what was or what we think what was and why what we think what was is better than what you think what was yeah it's like no one's gonna that's get a waste it. of time yeah no one's gonna get it a hundred percent you know mm -hmm. and we realize that and i i th think we might have conveyed that in the book i hope i hope we did that was the you intent know, i hope so <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying to think back i'm like did we get like did we spell did we? that one out yeah <laughs> We'll leave that as a cliffhanger for people to yes, read the book and yes, find and, out. And, and if we didn't, we blame the copy editor. <laughs> <laughs> now, Chris, you said something. Uh, uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> right? I'm picking on you now. Um, and you said it with a bit of emotion, so I can't just let it go that <laughs> we've got we've got to drop some of the nonsense. 
Yes. It, when you're talking about nonsense and what we've got to get rid of, let's be more specific. What is it that you are calling nonsense? Uh, the Murray theory. The the theory the theory from Doctor Margaret Murray. Yeah. Um, you know the whole fertility cut fertility cult theory. Um, possibly also the whole text of Aradia. All these things were extremely influential, and they still are, and people love them still. But you know what? They're not. Come on. I was going to say they're not gospel, but I'm pretty. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, right. It's gospel. Yeah, in 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 that sense. Um, The will of the year, you know, things that aren't relevant to our lives, really. You know, I I think people are fall. I mean, this is my opinion, and a bunch of your listeners are not going to agree with me, and I'm sorry, but let's just let's just talk we can agree to disagree here but we're not farmers and you know there's no reason for this for this count this ritual calendar um it's nice but i think some of us as in in a communal concept are falling into the traps that are falling into the traps of the religions that we left behind yeah you know it's just we're still practicing christianity but we're not calling it christianity anymore you know we, we practice yule we're celebrating yule not christmas we're celebrating ostara but not easter and we're celebrating this dying and, and birthing god who came from the come on um we're we're turning what we what some of us left we're just recreating what we left in a new guise and i think we're just going to fall into the same traps again creating church groups and all sorts of things like that i i, I think we're just we're, we're wedging ourselves into a weird corner um for a variety of reasons and these are just my personal opinions and they're going to piss everybody off <laughs> and I, that's 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 fair that's fair if you're mad at me for this that's totally fair um but that's just my personal opinion um so those are the things I th- I don't think they serve us very well, serve us very well. Um, I like that they, in it, but in a weird way, I like that they exist because they create a buffering situation for people like Black Tree to, and people who are also interested in traditional witchcraft and finding what witchcraft might have been. Because even though, in a sense, we're not practicing Wicca, Wicca is very accepted everybody else thinks we're practicing Wicca so we can do our own thing while everyone else thinks we're doing something else or quote unquote Wicca quote unquote Wicca. what, what, yes. what the modern public the, the the mundane public uh believes Wicca to be yeah and that's fine like we we as a community as a whole whatever community that is the Wiccan community the you know the the Druid community however the esoteric community however big that community stretches it's found a place in society which is great but I think that gives some of us at least the opportunity to go, you know, what was witchcraft? What do we really need to keep? What can we get rid of? Hey, let's see what else could work. Mm-hmm. And that, and mm-hmm. we have that opportunity now in the 21st century to internal, like on an internal scale, get rid of the crap that is really not appealing to some of us anymore. And that's, and that's what we do with black tree. Um, you know, getting rid of the will of the year, dropping this whole, you know, um, the, the whole gender binary God goddess thing, um, yeah, all of that stuff that shaped a lot of uh, the early Just years of the modern practice. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's kind of what I'm getting at. And I, now that I've, I've pissed off half of your audience, <laughs> if you want to complain, you can... <laughs> <laughs> that's that's yeah. a real that's a really heavy heavy topic to throw down on you. So. But. That's okay. That's the sort of things I like to get into, though, because oh. look, folks, if what Chris just said is making you angry in some way, I, I want you to think about why that's making you angry. Yeah, it, inspect be, it. That's right, because mm-hmm. it, you shouldn't be having these knee-jerk reactions to questioning what is being sold to us as traditions uh, when in fact many of them aren't even as was mentioned earlier haven't even reached 100 years old yet Mm -hmm. so examine why those things are meaningful to you and if they are in fact meaningful to you chris is not your (laughs) grand high (laughs) poobah right right like it's then that's your thing yeah Yeah. and it's totally it's totally still can be someone's thing like if someone doesn't like the way that we practice or the things that 
we are saying that we believe witchcraft to be, that's fine. Like, go, continue to go practice your thing. We're not trying to tell you that you can't. Um, we're just trying to say that this isn't what we do. And we're trying to find the other people who are like that. Um, but if someone gets something meaningful out of their local open circle and we, and going to their the Wheel of the Year celebrations and things like that, it, go for it. We you were know? All, I was there at one point, right? You know, like I, I I was that person. You know, like one of the things that that Tara wrote a, a wonderful blog about, which she can talk more on. But it's we all have our ways into the craft. Yeah. And to shame people for like, for example, for liking the basic witches book is wrong. Everyone has a way of getting into the craft. That's their, that's their gateway. I'm at a different point in my practice. And I, I realize that. So I'm not knocking anybody who is practicing differently than I am, mm -hmm. but I'm talking to the people who might actually be interested in where I'm at Yeah, to come with me. Or finding us, the the people who are new to all of this, yeah. who are the ones who are who want to be or involved that. involved in the things that we are involved in, and giving them that ability to skip over all of that time that got wasted for some people, <laughs> like floundering around <laughs> yeah. trying to find it. Like it was very different ten years ago. It was yeah. very different twenty years twenty years ago. ago. Um, to find other people who, who were into the same things that you were into. Yeah. I can't wait for the baby witches that pop up because of the chilling adventures of Sabrina. Oh yeah. Well, like, that, uh, Sabrina is just a great example. Mm -hmm. um, like, I can't wait changed. for them. Um, but that's also a part of the reason why we wrote Bezlem Stang and Sword the way that we did. It's a way to get into witchcraft without having to go through like the Scott Cunningham books or the Raymond Buckland books or the, the one-on-one stuff that Tara and I had when we were young. Um, Besom Stang and Sword is a way to get into witchcraft without having to go through Wicked first. Because not everybody wants that. An but accessible... that's what they find and it frustrates them. An accessible way as well. Yeah. You're right. And I like that you point that out too. I was just having this conversation the other day mm. with someone where I told them, look, cause they were asking me uh, how to get, like, how do you choose the book that Crowley wrote first? And I'm just right. like, you don't, you don't have to right. so go to Amazon and get six ways by Aiden Walker. Mm -hmm. mm. Fuck all that madness. You don't have to go down that road anymore. Right. <laughs> like, and, right. uh, and people who are interested in witchcraft, I'm telling them they need to get your book. Um, mm -hmm people thanks people who want you want more uh jason miller's got some excellent contributions out there yeah yes uh go to runesoup.com and go back mm -hmm. in the archives just click on a topic and read some of the blog posts that gordon wrote you yeah. know pick up chaos protocols you don't have to go through the old gatekeepers anymore no you and others and they... like you have contributed massive amounts of excellent material and they they, they have their place in this world but they don't it, it's the same thing about knowing your roots but keeping but stay facing forward you know mm -hmm. like don't don't ignore their existence um although there are absolutely some old standbys that i have never picked up a single book from um and i i will never tell anybody who those authors are um <laughs> but i i also i came into this very differently than chris did i didn't come into it via wicca or neo wicca or the the uu version of wicca I I've been solitary until we started Black Tree. I never worked with another coven. Um, uh, I mean, other than Crit. I mean, no, we, no, you didn't oh, even I, practice with me. Oh, I didn't even practice with you. No, we were together for thirteen years before we we ever even practiced together. Um, we just had two very very different paths that we were on, and I was always very much like no group work, no group work, and I'm still kind of squirrely about it, but I'm getting. I'm getting more used to it, um, especially as we bring new people into the coven and we start working with them and it's, it's changing and evolving. Um, but those, the old standbys have their place, but they don't need to be dipped in bronze and set up in the town square as the be all end all. Um, there's more out there. Yeah. There's and so much more out there. And there's still in those old standbys, they're still there if that's your jam. 
Yep. <laughs> I, mean, you know, I mean, honestly, <laughs> you know, if someone if someone wanted to get in the wicket, I would recommend Scott Cunningham. I would recommend Raymond Buckland. I would recommend Janet Stewart. The Ferrer. big blue book. I would recommend, you know, <laughs> stuff by Dor- Dorian Valiente. Mm-hmm. You know, like I would go there. I would recommend those books if that's what someone wanted. Absolutely. But if someone didn't want that, mm-hmm. what do you recommend? Right. Right. Mastering and Witchcraft by Paul Hewson is what? usually the one I go to. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I came up uh, through the occult with Chaos Magic as my operating system. Mm-hmm. I, I mm-hmm. delved into runes as a Chaos Magician. I delved into heathenry as a Chaos Magician. Yeah. I've explored everything that I do with this Chaos Magic operating system. So like earlier yeah. when you said, you know, the test is, does it work? That is kind of like all that ever mattered to me. Does it work? Do I get mm-hmm. what I want out of this? And if it doesn't, yeah. I'm not sure why I should spend my time. Yeah, why do I keep doing this? Chaos magic led me to Haitian voodoo for 13 years. Like, it's <laughs> uh, uh, one of the things that I always recommend to, like, baby tradcraft witches. Uh, and sometimes some of the more snootier uh, practitioners and writers get a little, like, fussy about this. I will absolutely recommend books on chaos magic for uh baby tradcraft witches because like i was saying earlier you need to be able to get out of that mindset and one of the best ways of learning how to do that is through chaos magic um because it's 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 starting you in that direction without you even realizing it and so then by the time you get into something like traditional witchcraft and you're able to to shed your your paradigms um and go into this with the open mind that you need to have for successful uh, practice. Yeah, I can tell you from my own personal experience over 20 years doing, you know, stuff like this, being part of different chaos magic communities, what happens to those of us who are actually practicing start discovering the spirits are probably real. Yeah. And now what do you do about that? Yeah. <laughs> or you, you start getting attached to specific spirits and then that starts growing into a whole thing or certain ones won't leave you alone because they're like, no, hey, over here, over here, over here. And you go, <laughs> no, man, I don't want that. And then shit, what am I doing over here? Right. <laughs> and speaking of over here, <laughs> there's a nice transition. You guys refer to what you're doing as regional witchcraft. And I don't think some people would understand exactly what you mean by regional witchcraft. Could you break that down? Yes. Um, <clears throat> Re- regional witchcraft is about. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Let me just get a drink here. You want to go make some tea? I can tell <laughs> you about hypnosis. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the question is, do we leave that bit in the show or out? No, oh, no that might be fun to leave in. <laughs> uh, regional witchcraft is about learning how to find your practice in your own backyard, um, as opposed to engaging with ancient deities, ancient spirits, ancient lands that have no actual relevance to where you live have no relevance to the land upon which you live to the land upon which you stand. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, not, not you know? so much ancient lands, ancient faraway lands. I think well, yeah. is the important part. Well, that, that and antiquated right worldviews mm-hmm. and old pantheons. Cause like it's a part of the things that I think we need to kind of consider, not get rid of. Cause I'm, I'm not going to be that bold in this regard, but why are we, you know, why as a as a, a a young man in South Jersey, why should I be worried about a Celtic deity? Bam. Mm-hmm. Why? Mm-hmm. I live in South Jersey. Why should I be worried about a deity from another country, from another century? What's going on right here and now? And as far as we're concerned, when we look at the idea of the genus Loki being like the consciousness of the land and the spirits of the land, we begin to realize that there is something right here that we can engage with. And in in our case, in South Jersey, the genus Loki for us, the primary land spirit is the Jersey devil, which is our local, our lo- local cryptoid, you it's know, our, our state lo- monster, our state monster. Um, and that sounds absurd, but when you think about it in the sense that the story of the Jersey Devil is actually a manifestation of the land itself 
as it has filtered its way up through the hearts and minds of the people who live on the land. So this egregor is our way of tapping into the region. Um, another way that we tap into the region is we drink local wine. South Jersey has a really booming wine industry. Um, so we only drink local wine in ritual, we, in ritual um, and in life too. You well, know? that's I mean, just because we tend to like it. But... So it's about, <laughs> <laughs> it's about engaging with the land in a variety of ways in the mm -hmm. local culture. You know, so like attending the festivals, you know, like we have blueberry festivals and cranberry festivals and yeah, pumpkin Jer Jersey's festivals. Yeah, Jersey's like full and... on for the agricultural festivals. We we got one for everything around here and yeah. it's all year long. You know, <laughs> so like an example used in the book, if you're going to vacuum your home, you don't plug your vacuum in down the street. You plug it into the outlet that's right behind you. And that's what we're talking about by regional witchcraft. Okay. And then how would you handle someone using that kind of argument to shift into more of a kind of a blood and soil kind of gatekeeping? Uh, because you can be standing on whatever land and be in touch with that particular land. It's not about your culture. It's about your connection with the actual land itself. So, like, we could be living in a country. Um, we, we could go to somewhere, not New Jersey, and still be practicing regional witchcraft, but we would not be connecting to the land in the same way. We wouldn't connect to the Jersey Devil if we were in Guam. But here's, but yeah, but here's the thing. If you have lived here long enough where there's more than one generation of your family here, regardless of where, like my family, if you trace it far enough back, you'll, I'll find relatives in Italy. However, I do have family who have been born and died on this soil. So when I, and when I say this, I'm not talking about ignoring first nations people by any means, but the reality of the situation is, is that a lot of us also have blood ties to this land as well, because we have, our blood decomposing in the soil elements of our family in the soil becoming one with the soil your grandfather who was buried in in a field is now a tree that grew in that field your your relatives become land spirits by default but that also doesn't say that having this type of connection to the land means that you can say to someone, you can't do that to this land either, or, or you can't do that to this land too. Like if someone were to move here, move to New Jersey, for instance, um, and they were from Oregon, we're not going to tell them that they can't connect to the land here because they're not from here and because they don't have family here. No, not at all. Um, not, not by any means. There's no absolutes. No, there's, there's really. never any absolutes. Um, and with this type of thing, it's if you have a connection to this particular land, then foster it and steward it and get, get as tight with it as you want. Um, but just because you weren't born here or because you don't have family here, um, that, that doesn't mean that someone can't be attached to that particular land. Yeah. Um, just as a, as an, a nation in as the United States, it's difficult to do because we're such a transient people. Yeah. And there's also the issue of of appropriation, which is also a very relevant topic. But like, you can't appropriate spirits because the spirits have been here you can appropriate how the spirits are interpreted names the names of the spirits how they're interacted with you can you can appropriate culture but you can't appropriate the idea of a spirit in the land you know you find your own names for it your own ways of interacting with it and how it works and functions and exists so I don't want to get what we're talking about and, and have that be confused with this idea of appropriation mm -mm. um just just so that's clear yeah like we're not laying claim to any of the um who who would be in this area um the and lenape the lenape the, yeah. any of the like there's there's nothing like that going on we're, we're not trying to make lay, lay claim to any type of uh first peoples um 
practices or or names or or anything like that we don't even try to and if by any chance we should happen to have contact with a spirit that is also one of their spirits we probably wouldn't even know for starters um just because that information is not readily available um but even if we were to find that out we would never even try to keep that connection going like like trying to constantly connect our spirit with their spirit and saying oh no they're the same thing like no now now it's too different that the egregore has changed um this this is our connection to it this is how we see it it's how it's being done <laughs> that was all very well handled and well said i and Thanks. really going back to your outlet analogy you're you're really just saying that you know the world's covered in outlets did just mm-hmm. plug into the one that's closest to you and mm-hmm. see what happens yeah. No, that very well handled. Thank you for taking the time to go a little deeper into that. Yeah, sure. Oh, no, you're welcome. Thank now, you for asking. Now, <laughs> uh, the name of your coven is Black Tree, and that's got to have some relevance in why you chose that name. Could you explain what that is? Sure. A lot of um, a lot of the tradition, which we also call Black Tree, was forged out of clearing off a table for example a metaphoric table and putting something on it and seeing if it worked it's like you know you put the lamp down does that lamp work how does it work is it the right lamp should it be there should it be left should it be in the center why is the lamp there why is the lamp here why use a lamp at all you know? <laughs> <laughs> so so a lot of what black tree has become was a was a was like that and in another way it's kind of like a game of plinko where the chip is going down the pegboard and it's finding its path and finding its place. Um, the name black tree itself grew out of it for me, this is how it all, it all grew out of. Um, I, w- I was, I initi- was I was briefly involved in a gardenerian coven and the name that I initiated under was blackthorn. Um, and I, <clears throat> I use that name because of the Blackthorn tree and because of his associations with witchcraft and necromancy. Um, and so that kind of stuck with me. And when I left that coven, Tara and I were involved with, um, we were not involved. We were interested in working with Peter Patton who eventually I had on the show. Um, and then he, he passed away literally like two days after I spoke to him, which was really upsetting. Um, wow. But in Peter's teachings, you know, he, he had a YouTube channel. He was also a podcaster. He had a coven Briar Rose out in California. They may still be functioning. I'm not sure. Um, he, one of the things he talked about was the hex star, mm-hmm. uh, which we call the black tree. And the name itself kind of grew out of, like my name Blackthorn and for some reason I like this idea of Black Tree for the Coven and then I began to realize that that's actually a name that applied very well to the symbol Mm -hmm. and it kind of just snowballed in that way so like it it, it started out being a little superficial a little bit of an aesthetic thing but then we actually realized that there was something there and then we began to explore that idea further and a lot of those ideas that grew out of that exploration became the black tree chapter in the book, and we, which is chapter six <laughs> by no accident, <laughs> by no accident by no whatsoever. Accident. It had to be chapter six. Um, but we also, there was a little bit of um, when we were trying to figure it all out um, because so much of our figuring out our practice and with everything we're doing comes down to, uh, let, let's do a journey. Like if, if Chris and I come to come to an impasse where we cannot convince the other one of what our case is, then usually it is solved by journey work or let's ask the ancestors. And one of the things that started all of this was when he was talking about Blackthorn. And at first it was, oh, well, we're going to call this Blackthorn witchcraft. No, that's silly. I can't name this after myself. <laughs> this isn't Van Halen. Um, <laughs> it's not Van Halen. It's not Van Halen. Be that's actually something that I shouted. Yeah, <laughs> I, I shouted it in the airport. This is not Van Halen. Um, but then like we, we kind of like started riffing on, well, what does Blackthorn mean? And, and following that trail and, and putting things together and then 
hearing the stuff from Peter about the hex and putting it together with the uh, Axis Mundi and the World Tree and this thing and the Hex Star and it and then it slowly started to form into its own thing. It wasn't like a conscious decision of Black Tree, you know. It it was this whole meandering journey that brought us to naming it Black Tree and bringing us to the concept of the black tree as the as the world tree as the axis monday so the, there's also definitely there's a there's a practical aspect to the name and then there was also very much like a mystical boo spooky aspect to it to, to it as well yeah and it's cool that you brought up peter Patton because you know when i when i read a book that i'm really like enjoying and i know i'm going to reference again i mm -hmm. i'm terrible human being i beat the shit out of my dog ear pages i, I write oh, yeah. in my underline i make my own index in the back mm -hmm. everything else mm -hmm. <laughs> and one of my favorite parts in the book uh page 188 if people are wanting to know is tapping the bone <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah and it says right here the the concept was first introduced to us by the late and very much missed peter Patton, 1964 mm -hmm. to 2014 in his A Grimoire for Modern Cunning Folk. And in that book, Pad discusses tapping into the ancestral memory contained in your own blood to retrieve lost lore. It can also be used to obtain answers about the present or past, whether your questions are related to family or to life in general. That is fucking cool. <laughs> <laughs> and just the the whole title of the tapping the bone so tapping the bone as a practice you know since <laughs> since you brought him up um could you give maybe one specific example of using that practice i can help i've got it right here <laughs> yeah, I, think, I think he found it's it. on uh, page 147 um one th one way where uh Tapping the bone as a technique gave us insight that f that filtered its way into the book is the section on seasonal shifting. And this was something that I did. I just did this ritual one morning where, you know, I was talking to the ancestors before work and I decided to do a bit of a tapping the bone type ritual where I went into a trance and I started just thinking about the black tree as a symbol. Mm. And then I got this, these series of revelations, that's the only, way, only word to use for it, series of revelations, you know, pictures in my head, thoughts, inspirations, ideas that just flooded into my brain and didn't really want to slow down either as they were happening. But it was this idea of the seasonal shifting that happens uh, through the year. And um, so like right now we're in February. So we are in the middle world. Technically. You need to unlock your iPhone first. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why she did it. You need to unlock your iPhone first. <laughs> Apparently, I said something that sounded something like that I was so, talking, some trigger word. I was from talking Siri. to Siri. Um, <laughs> I, I apologize. She was on mute, <laughs> and she still decided to There's, speak up. There's a thing you can turn yeah. that off. Anyway, so we're in February and I had this, this revelation came to me that, and this may not be anything that is a, like people may already be into this and this may already actually be a thing. They and that's, like, yeah, no shit. Yeah, no shit, up. asshole. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's this idea that the, the, it's in that, it's using the three world model of, you know, upper world, middle world, underworld. And it's the idea that, the worlds shift and they, they kind of move up and move down as we carry ourselves through the year. So on Halloween from Halloween, they do this for three month intervals. So like from Halloween to the beginning of February, we're in the underworld, you know, or rather the underworld kind of starts to merge with our world. And then for three months after February, so like from February to the end of April, we're in the middle world where things kind of just feel normal in a sense. And then from the end of April to the beginning of August, you know, for that three month period, you know, May, June, and July, we're in the upper world. And then after August, you know, for August, August, September, and October, we're in the middle world. 
and it's just this idea that we move in and out and we merge with these different worlds and you know i think that that kind of explained to me you know why the veil gets thin at certain times and i know that's even questionable historically speaking yeah a- um, adrian bott wrote a thing recently about that but in my heart this is how it feels you this know is that your truth. this is my truth yeah so the tapping the bone ritual helped bring that to light and it gave me something to sit with and to consider and to work with. Um, and that's one of the reasons why, as far as like, you know, we've gotten rid of the wheel of the year as far as our practice goes, but we've chosen to hold on to Halloween specifically and uh, the opposite, end the of opposite the end of the year, which, you know, a lot of people would associate with Beltane. Um, but we look at it as Hexanoct, which is the witch's night. So like these are our two Sabbath nights, but these are also the times when the the worlds shift back and forth. I dig it. I like it. So <laughs> that's that's one of the ways that tapping the bone has has mm-hmm. directly affected Black Tree as a practice and as a uh, as a conceptual system. Mm-hmm. You know, it's one of the components in it. I really like it. That was really cool. Um, we're we're a little over an hour. I I can still keep you because it's not Chris's bedtime yet. <laughs> we're good if you're good. However long yeah, you want to talk, I'm, we're cool. I'm going to make sure I follow all the gremlin rules. So <laughs> 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 this is the part of the show where I like to get into the haunted questions. Nice. Okay. So being a cult practitioner, it's my favorite topic to get into (laughs) with fellow cult practitioners even because you know our approach is always so much different usually than your Mm -hmm. typical paranormal investigator so with all that said all the rambling to get here have either of you ever experienced a haunting seeing a ghost i know chris has seen shimmering spirits and ritual but this isn't quite the same thing i'm talking the house is haunted or gone to a haunted location and had an experience Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Do tell. <laughs> um, this is why you got kicked uh, out of the UK, isn't it? Because no. they said, tell us, tell us where, why you're here. And you said, no. <laughs> I see ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I am one of those individuals. Um, and I have been, I've been like this for just about my entire conscious life. Um, I see things. I don't know what exactly this is. I don't give it a name, um, that, but they are absolutely hallucinations. Um, so I've always seen stuff, even when I was little. Um, and it's difficult sometimes to figure out whether or not what you are seeing is actually happening, whether it is a spirit experience or if it is something like a haunting um, because I can it, using spirits and haunting in two very very different terms, or brain thing, or 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 uh, the the uh, skeptic side of everything is bitch be crazy, <laughs> <laughs> bitch be crazy, um, or bitch be crazy, <laughs> um, or something something's going on in your brain that is actually causing this. Although then you can have the argument of is the something going on in your brain that's causing this actually allowing you to see these um, phantasmagorical type of things. Um, so all of that said. Um, my very, very first experience that I can remember, I was probably about two or three. Um, I was in my brother's bedroom for some reason. And I don't, I don't fully remember why I was sleeping in this room that night. We were living in an apartment at the time and I I was young enough to wear both of my brothers still lived at home because my one brother was is 13 years older than me. Um, so he was still at home. But for some reason, I was put to bed in his room. And the adults and such were having some type of gathering in, in the living room of the apartment. I don't know if it was a party or some kind of dinner. I, I, don't, I don't remember that. Um, but I remember very, very clearly the door opening... Um, and I'm, and I'm in a dark room, you know, there's a little bit of light coming in from the window from like the, uh, the street lights outside, but you know, it's, it's a dark room and it's probably like 
eight 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 thirty during the summer so maybe not like pitch black um and i remember the door opening and something coming into the room that was not a person um it didn't have the shape of a person it wasn't the height of a person it was the height of a very large dog of which we did not have at the time um but only like the size the size of it was dog ish um it was a quadruped of some type or at least moving on four four uh limbs and i watched it come into the room the door closed behind it and it walked up to the bed and i don't remember what its face or anything looked like um all i remember is just like a, a vague idea of like a white white ish shape in the dark and it reached up and grabbed my hair and yanked really, really hard. And I started screaming as little girls do when their hair gets pulled by something in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> and it fucked off. Like, I don't even remember if it went through a wall or where it went. It was just suddenly not in the room anymore because the door had been flung open by probably my screaming mother. Um that was the very first time that I ever experienced anything. But like over the years and growing up, um, there were always occurrences that happened in the homes that we were living in. Um, in particular, the house that I mentioned earlier, the one that we lived in for five years, the longest we were ever anywhere. That was probably the house that had the most activity. Um, it was also one of the few times that my family even lived in a house. We normally lived in apartments. Uh, hang on. And that particular house, it wasn't even that old. Um, maybe 70, 70 years old or something like that. The town that we lived in wasn't an, an especially aged town or anything. There was nothing of note about it. Um, but this house just had a lot of activity in it. Um, things were moved. People were touched. Um, one of my friends saw uh, a an apparition go up the steps. Um, th things went missing. Uh, definite parts of the house had feelings to them. There was uh, an extremely creepy basement. I mean, most basements are creepy, but this one really excelled at it. Like the minute you went down there, it was just like this feeling of dread. Um, and then we also had a, uh, a well in the floor that would occasionally flood. Um, and we would have to bail the basement out because they put the sump pump on the other side of the basement and it had a tilt. Um, but mushrooms would grow down there. So they're like that added to it as well. It was just a very creepy um, place. And at some point, one of the former owners had like tried to finish the basement. So it looked like they had uh, laid out the structure of a room to be built and there was a door frame. And you couldn't get me to go through that door frame for God nor country. And my one brother used to try and push me through it all the time because he was a dick. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> through all of that, I became friends with someone who uh, from high school who lived around the corner and he knew the family who lived there before us. And he confirmed other things to me that he experienced in the house, being touched, seeing things. Uh, the family talking about experiencing things like that. Um, and we we tried to do a little bit of research, but this was in like the early, late, late 80s, early 90s. We did not have the internet capability to like look stuff up and see like maybe what had gone on there. The only thing I know is that the house next door used to be a very tiny like Baptist church kind of thing, but was now just a house. It was a, didn't even look like a church. Um after that, just over the years, I've lived in other places that did have some type of activity, not nearly at those levels. Um, Chris had a ghost cat uh, <laughs> in his one apartment that I used to that I used to call to all the time in my sleep. <laughs> um, but yeah, so and, and then he he I know he's got stories too. I don't have a whole lot of stories, not a whole lot, but, but you you got you have some. I mean, one one of the things that. Um got me interested in the paranormal and just like just the weird side of life was when I was very, 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 very young. Um, 
one of my earliest memories is is seeing a white figure standing in my doorway over a period of three evenings. And I always kind of thought that it was my grandfather who had passed away at the time. Um, at least that's how I remember it. And I believe I thought that at the time too, but it was always still really freaked me out having this white figure standing in the hallway that couldn't really be explained by any kind of a night light or what have you. Um, and it was always as I was going to bed and I would hide under the covers and then eventually it would just be gone. But it was a series of three nights that this happened. Um, so that was like, that, that's the one thing that really brought me into, um, the occult. Um, as far as other experiences go, there was a period of time where I did a lot of, uh, electronic voice recording. Um, and I did enough of that where I was convinced that that was a thing that happened and I mm -hmm. was perfectly content with it as a phenomenon and I hadn't really done it since. <laughs> well, we, we got a couple of pretty good ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and we, we used to go places and yeah. like crank out the we, stupid and actually, equipment. And we still get them when, when I interview <laughs> people, we still get them in the audio once in a while. Mm -hmm. So I have to edit them out. Yeah. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, yeah. but we, we've gone to, uh. <laughs> uh old freemason lodges and done and done like a walkthrough of the place you know filmed it and recorded and then went back and listened to and see if it could be find anything we were at the hotel maycomer in cape may um well, we were friends we, we with were the, that's what i was gonna say we yeah. were friends with the guys from Haunted, new jersey um uh al and Gar garrett who unfortunately passed away some years ago um we we used to go to stuff with them and they would have these events and and it it was fun um but we we got a couple of pretty good evps like ones that even like my bitchy ass will be like yeah you know like, i can hear that one usually i'm like no that sounds like brr, brr, brr. and he's no it sounds like avocado <laughs> um, but it was it was fun you know yeah that's cool you know i will <clears throat> excuse me i will i do like to suggest if you've got um, digital recorders and you your experience trying to collect EVPs and you also happen to be into the occult that you should mm -hmm. throw that recorder on the altar once in a while and see oh, what shows up <laughs> on there. <laughs> we get some pretty interesting shadows that, that pop up in the room um, whenever we do ritual um, and uh, I watch them out of the corner of my eye because I'm usually trying to figure out like what in the room is hitting what to cause that shadow to be happening. And if I can't identify something, that's when I start watching it out of the corner of my eye to see what it's going to do or if it's going to do anything. Like maybe it's just hanging out, <laughs> um, hanging out, watching us, which is cool. <laughs> that is cool. Now, mm. if, if a friend came to you too and says, you know, my house is haunted and, and everything has gone batshit crazy, you know, like the phone mm. is, like a thing spewing out of it. The walls are melting. <laughs> uh, voices are coming out of the TV and it's not on. So, <laughs> you know, and they're like, uh, I know you you're, stay. I know you're witches. Please help. <laughs> how do you, how would you help somebody if they were really asking you for help with um, a haunting in their own home? I think it would depend on what their individual circumstances were like what is going on in the home is there maybe a 13 year old girl um, <laughs> is there a menop a premenopausal woman um are just tensions really high for other reasons like you you have to like uh, weed through everything eliminate the mundane and then what's left like the minute you can't explain something then then maybe kind of try examine that from a couple of different angles but like so it, it's not like just going in like i'm going to come in and do an exorcism and fix everyone's problems because that's not responsible um and i i work in social services i i work in human resources for social services oh so i am the social worker for the social workers yeah. <laughs> All of my days are spent talking about people's boundaries and what's responsible and ethical and going into a, a fractured situation and not just trying to make myself out to be uh, Captain Savaho, 
um, not not coming into us as a savior and and trying to fix all of these things because that's not responsible to do. You don't know what the underlying causes are. This might not be a haunting. It might be abuse. It it might be a, a prepubescent child who the energy of their coming puberty is just driving everything in the house crazy um, and causing like poltergeist activity and things like that. So you can't just come in swinging like you're going to fix this because you might make it worse. So depending on the friend and depending on their level of comfort with witchiness um, and depending on what my knowledge of the household situation is, there could be some maybe, hey, here's this Florida water that I made you. Maybe you could spray this around around your home or maybe burn some mugwort or yeah. uh, like like little things like that. If it's if it's a minor enough situation. Yeah, that or or try to do some recording and see maybe if you can get answers that way and find out what's going like see that level of it, you know. Right. You check all your mundane things, all your practical things, get a little witchy, get get a little ritually, get a little more investigative with like throwing down a recorder, mm -hmm. um, maybe do a little history on the house, speak to a former owner, you know. Speak to everyone who lives there. Really learn about the situation. Right. I mean, who, who's the person who says if you hear hoof if you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras? <laughs> um, I can't I can't remember who who was the first person to say hmm. say something like that. But it's it's the concept of if you have this phenomenon, first rule out the mundane before you start looking into the fantastical. Um, and yeah, I, I think keeping those things in mind and then bringing like. Chris's end of it, like the more paranormal, paranormal investigation end of things like, all right, well, let's set up some voice recorders and see what else we get. I mean, yeah, I mean, in some of our some of our past experiences, when we were more in, involved in doing home investigations, um, we would give people practical resolutions to situations. And when they didn't follow through with them, we'd kind of drop them because we were like, you're not going to you obviously want this to be a fantastical situation. You don't want to consider these practical things first and then see what happens. Like taking baby steps towards the resolution. You know, they, they instantly wanted us to, to sleep over and to record and, and to, and, and to just make them seem like a phenomenon. And that's not healthy because no. that's not actually fixing any well, that's, problem. It's that may feeding exist. into the delusion. Yeah. If there's a delusion it, going well, on. Well, I mean, I'm just, you know. Feeding into the illusion will go for a, a lesser illusion. <laughs> <laughs> all, it's all very good advice, and it's very practical in your approach. <laughs> uh, I'm, it, nothing you said would be anything less than very beneficial to anyone that was seeking help. So mm -hmm. I, I like how you point out, especially that you need to know a little bit more about what's going on in the home. Cause oftentimes I, I found in my own experience, people are often the ones haunting themselves. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I, I actually have a really, really interesting. If I may occupy more of the time. Please do. So, um, when I was involved in a South Jersey paranormal research oh, group, um, <laughs> what I said, a, it, there's, just, there were it, lots of them at the this time. Goes, this goes back this to is Garrett, an joke. Garrett this is an old joke trouble. from Hunter, New Jersey. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we were investigating this home where <clears throat> the group that I was in a part of, um, we were investigating this home where the mother thought that the, her son was possessed by the devil or something like that. Like you do. Uh, like you do. Of course. And I'm like, oh, you know, and so I'm listening to this story and something dawned on me. Okay. This was in 2006 when this happened. This was in August or September of 2006. And as I'm hearing the scenario before we even get to the home, it dawned on me and I turned to the people in the group and I said, do you know what movie came out back in June? And they were like, what? 
Mike. The remake of The Omen. <laughs> June 6th came out on June 6th, the sixth month of the year, on the sixth day, in, in the sixth year of the new century. This is The Omen story. Mm. So, you know, let's let's look at it like that, okay? The, oh, and my, mind you, sorry, they were also like, yeah, this has been going on for like three or four months. And I was like, do you know what like came time, out? The time frame. Yeah, I was like, you know what movie came out three months ago? You know, kind of thing. <laughs> and they were just like, oh. <clears throat> so then even when we went to the house, they, 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 these people watch the ghost hunters way too much. So they were like, oh, if the room is hot, then that means it's going to give the spirits energy to manifest things. <laughs> so what did that woman do? She immediately turned down the thermostat. <laughs> And I was just, and I was like, and I turned to the, the, I guess the head, the lead, the leader, if you want to call him that. Lead I'm like, I'm like, um, anything we tell her, she's going to turn around and use on her child. Yeah. Yeah. For the sake of everything. I, I mean, I honestly didn't believe this woman at all, but for, I was like, for the sake of everything, you have to tell her there's nothing going on here mm. because she's going to take it out on this poor boy. Wow. And that's a that's a that's a true story. That's a, a God honest true story. Mm. Wow! It was so irresponsible to go in there and to sensationalize this woman's household because she obviously had problems. You know, like there was there was something going on here. You know, you look at the state of the home. You look at the the person who looks like they're on a coke binge. <laughs> um, Day fifty four of I mean, meth binge. And, and, <laughs> and the story, and the story that is like mm -hmm. a you know the plot of the omen. You know, it's been going on for three months and the in the omen, the remake came out three months prior. You know, it was just and, and then also putting it, it would have been irresponsible to address that situation. And putting all way. of these things into a further context, this was at the height of the popularity of Ghost Hunters. Yes, that's two thousand six. Um, two thousand six. So every it was what all of the Island of Misfit Toys was getting into. Um and, and so it was just becoming like a thing. And the attention feeding off of the attention feeding off of the uh, attention. Um, and what, one, of the, one, one of the things that it always reminds me of is the TV show Hoarders, where people blunder into a situation um, where something is obviously going very, very awry. And you send in this half half-ass team of quasi professionals uh, under the guise of "we're going to fix it," <laughs> and it just creates even more massive chaos, um, and, and just has the potential of of doing so much damage that people just really do not understand. Um, luckily, now in 2019, I'm not hearing so much about groups that do things like that. But also at the same time, we've dropped off of that radar. Um, we stopped actively going out into out, out into the field, if you want to be goofy about it, <laughs> and, and doing investing and doing investigations. You know, haunted New Jersey isn't really a thing anymore. Garrett passed away. We don't go to events like that, so we're not seeing what's happening in that community in this area if those things even still are happening because there's always going to be people who are uh attempting to cultivate a spookier than thou air about themselves i mean i i knew people like that in high school and and in my 20s there's there's always some jackass who is trying to pretend that they've been possessed by the devil or their kids possessed by the devil so there's always going to be those, but I'm wondering about how the groups now are handling things like that, um, especially with the mindset of personal responsibility and and things of that nature. I don't know. Um, that was me just kind of thinking about it and rambling out loud. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I went into a direction like, things have really changed since 20, 2006. Yeah. How that, is that handled and now? That, and obviously that's not to say that this stuff doesn't happen, that, that hauntings no. aren't true. Obviously. No. You know, I mean. We, there's there's more than enough evidence to oh, show totally, that they are. Totally, totally, But if you hear hoofbeats. Well, <laughs> of course not zebras. Of course yeah. it's not zebras. <laughs> you know, um two former guests on the show, Greg and Dana Newkirk, they run the traveling museum of the paranormal and occult. I've done projects with them. Oh, cool. They're really good people. Um, mm -hmm. they, they are kind of insert, helping insert this idea of people are, you know, intentions are creating environments. 
it rather than mm. maybe a demon always being there that kind of thing but mm. when i had them mm -hmm. on the show <laughs> we were talking about hauntings and stuff and um i was basically introducing them to the concept of animism you know like if, if the concept of animism is true and just assuming let's just assume human spirits alone if only one or two of every hundred stick around and haunt a location considering the billions of people who have lived and died on every seemingly every square foot of the planet at some point mm -hmm. you know you can't go anywhere without bumping into a ghost somehow and greg's answer is one i'll never forget he says yep they're staring at your boners dude <laughs> <laughs> yep that's amazing <laughs> <laughs> so you know thank yep. greg for that little uh, entertainment that's mm -hmm. yet again touched our lives <laughs> bless him <laughs> no but you know chris you that that story you shared about the the kid my my favorite part of all that i mean i love how you notice the pattern you got the pattern recognition and you see what's going on but it's the witch in the room who's the voice of reason right <laughs> How great is that? Right. <laughs> <laughs> See, we can do it. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, we're coming towards that end of the regular broadcast. Thank you so much for giving me this much of your time. I deeply appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you for having oh, us. Thank you for having yeah. us. It's been a yeah, blast. You guys have yeah. been wonderful. Now, is there something I should have asked or something you'd like to talk about that I didn't cover? Or do you have any parting thoughts you'd like to share with everyone? Awesome. Thank you. Uh, well, I mean, we're going to, if you're on the East Coast, we're going to be at Delmarva Pagan Pride, which is in April. In April this year, not yeah, August. 2009. Yeah. Um, and then we're also going to be appearing at Temple Fest, you know, put on by the Temple of Witchcraft. In uh, August. In August, you know, which is <laughs> happening up in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. So. And then we'll be um, at our, our normal South Jersey Pagan Pride in October and yeah. Philly Pagan Pride in September, usually. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a couple of other things that are that are happening here and there, but mostly right now we're kind of recuperating from the writing and publishing of the book, and then being complete and utter idiotic masochists and putting together book proposals for the next round. Um, so that's currently the task that we are under is, yes. is getting getting that particular fire under both of our particular asses. <laughs> to get that accomplished um all while living life and yelling at cats and putting together <laughs> our coven and <laughs> and trying to do the show still and trying to do our show still and yeah. um but yeah we're, we're we're chugging along and doing our thing we want to get some things set up like not like a book tour book tour but the the stores that are within like probably like a two two to three hour drive of us like maybe doing events uh, smaller events and stuff like that um and and see how that goes uh so yeah that's our plan <laughs> very cool um so <laughs> where can people find you your show and your book um anybody can find me on facebook as tara love mcguire um that's mcguire m-a-g-u-i-r-e um also on instagram as I shall go into a hair, um, which is where all of my photography is. I take a lot of photos, particularly during uh, the growing season uh, from like May to November. It's pretty much um, uh, what our friend Amy refers to as photos of photos of bugs on plants. Um, <laughs> Um, um, I also have a Twitter, uh, the Juniper Tree, but I almost never do anything on Twitter. That's more Chris's thing. Um, and then uh, the, it, the website is infinite-beyond.com. Correct. And then uh, and that has infinite-beyond.com has all of our, all of our appearances stuff. and links and social media links and everything like that. And the mm -hmm. blog and where you can find the, sh the show down at the crossroads can be found pretty much on any podcasting platform it's on spotify it's on iheart radio it's on tune in radio it's on the itunes podcast app it's on google play so where's your social media place. bro well, i'm on twitter <laughs> I, chris orapello i'm on twitter i'm on instagram <laughs> facebook all those 
Um, thankfully, I used that name early on, so that's all me. If you search Google for Chris, Chris Orapello or Christopher Orapello, about 95 to 99% of those links are all me. Nice. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, I'm doing a service to the other Chris Orapello and hiding him away yeah, from... Yeah, who we're friends with. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I can't really hide because no. that's my name. Yeah. And that's what I've been using. So I tried very hard to get LonnieScott.com and there's some poor schmuck who keeps trying to win sheriff in some county in Michigan year oh. after year. Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> He's not giving up, so Oh, that dude. And more power to him. I'm not buying it. <laughs> 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 All right, guys. Um once again, thank you for being here and this is one of those occasions where I want to remind everyone listening, if you haven't checked out down at the crossroads, please do. Uh, it is absolutely one of my favorite podcasts. In fact, when people say, are there paranormal or occult podcasts they should be listening to? Of course, I'm going to tell you to listen to this one, but following is always down at the crossroads second on the list. <laughs> so thank you. you're welcome. Thank and you. thank you guys for doing all the work that you do. It's, it's incredible mm-hmm. that that content is being put out in the world. All right, gang. Thank you very much. If you want to hear us get a little bit weirder, come over to patreon.com slash weirdwebradio. Go to weirdwebradio.com. Freshly rebuilt, pretty new website. And click join the membership. Please do. Otherwise, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for taking the time to listen to us. I hope you found some great value in this. Stay weird out there, my friends. Okay, gang. That's a wrap on this episode of Weird Web Radio. Once again, thank you all for listening. Now, it's time for you to go join the official Weird Web Radio membership. Go to patreon.com slash weirdwebradio and you can choose your rewards and become a member today. Enjoy all the exclusive benefits, inside information, and plenty of bonus audio with each guest. Now, you can find the show at weirdwebradio.com and weirdwebradio.lipsin.com. The show is listed on Facebook and Twitter as Weird Web Radio. And you can find me on Instagram as just Lonnie underscore Scott. Please remember to rate and comment and share the shows that you like. And it helps others find us in all the search results. Shoot me an email if you want to be a guest on the show or if you know someone that would be a great guest in upcoming episodes. You can send that to weirdwebradio at gmail.com. Seek the mysteries and delights in life, my friends. As always, stay weird out there.